So I figured it was about time that I uh, did a video on all this because I've gone through some changes and um, I see a lot of videos of people that have done something similar to what I've done and um, I have some advice that I think is helpful. So I'm going to post it. Um, so I haven't announced it on my YouTube channel. I don't really use YouTube much except for posting geek tutorials, fixing things. Um, but uh, I have been going through a transition on um, my gender. So I have had what is called a uh, gender affirming surgery. And basically what I did was I had my chest turned into more or less a male chest. And I identify as a non-binary person. So I have my body match that. And I had this done on winter solstice on December 21st in 2018. So I am right at the four month recovery mark and it's probably as healed as it's ever going to get. The scars should lighten over time but um, it's pretty healed. Um, you might notice there's a little part here that's bleeding. That's not any, that's a cat scratch. The cat got me, so <laughs> not related. But anyway, um, here's my result. I used Dr. Shen at Dartmouth Hitchcock Hospital in Lebanon, New Hampshire. He was really great to work with. Um, the hospital was very good. I didn't have many bad experiences. Well, I had no bad experiences during the surgery. Getting the drains out was another matter, and I'll go over that, but I'm going to go over this kind of chronologically, so I'll come back around to that. But my surgery went really well. Um, it's a double incision surgery. It was a free nipple graft, meaning all of the guts that were in here are completely gone. There's nothing here but skin and muscle and a little bit of fat. And as you can see, my contour is a little less masculine than some people get with the surgery and I requested that. I wanted to have a little bit more fill than some people. I didn't want to have a flat chest. Now that being said, I'm not 100% happy with it but most people that get top surgery don't end up 100% happy with it. As you can see I've got a little puffiness right here that I don't have on this side so it looks like this side's bigger and it visually also makes this this nipple area look higher than that one, but I think it's just because this looks puffy, because when you do that, like it, it looks pretty, pretty normal. So, and then I also have um, what I'm calling a meat roll here on this side. Um, some people who get the surgery have a really short incision because they had a smaller chest and they had more elastic skin. I'm over 40 and I had had children in the past so my breast skin was very stretched and had no elasticity um, and also had fallen a bit and then I bound them down so like they were just they hung down like hag tits but anyway <laughs> um, what had to happen was because of that instead of getting a little incision like you see some people they only have a little incision from here to here that's nice and straight my doctor had to make a an incision and I actually wish he would have gone a little bit further in because I had like some saggy skin there that he could have cut out, but um, we'll get to that. Um, and he had to come all the way around, and as you can see, my incisions go way back, all the way back to where my shoulder blade comes down, way all the way back to my back and on the side. Um, so the reason why that had to happen is just because I had so much extra skin. I had really large breast, and they had um, the fat was distributed all the way back here, so he tried to you know, like reduce that down. And unfortunately, he got most of the skin, like I think the skin is tight enough, but there's still a lot of fat in there. Or maybe it's scar tissue. I did have my um, my three month checkup and he said it felt normal, but I still feel like there's something, it feels like hard in there and I don't know if that's completely normal. So um, I'm going to go back and see him at the six month mark and that will be like my final checkup. And then we can talk about revision. And um, most guys who get the surgery um, end up needing revision. So I went in knowing that and I went in knowing that I would probably need it. And um, 
And because I went in knowing that, I'm really happy with how it turned out. And, um, and I'll need a little bit of touch up, but that's fine because, um, I have other work I needed done anyway. My belly is disgusting. So I want to get a tummy tuck to get rid of all of this. So when we get rid of this, which I have to save money for because the insurance doesn't cover that, insurance covered this, which is also something I should touch on. Medicare does pay for top surgery, so long as you have a medical need. And um, because I have gender dysphoria, I had a medical need, and also because um, I was so big. So I, I could have actually just qualified for a breast reduction, which they also would have covered because I had enough breast tissue that it was physically pulling me forward and making me really have like neck pain and stuff. So there's a few ways you can get covered with Medicare and uh, it's totally doable. So I guess what I really want to do is talk about less about my result because the result is clear. I mean, I'm really happy with it. It just needs a little bit of touch up work and I'll get that done. But what, do I, what I really think that people need help with with this is, um, is how to prepare. Because I joined a couple of, um, of trans support groups on Facebook. And one of the recurring things that comes up in the group over and over again is, what do I need to do in preparation for my top surgery? And all of us that have done it, like... <clears throat> We type the same things out over and over again, but something always gets left out. So I'm mean, gonna try to like make a video and then I can just post this there. Um, but obviously I'm long-winded, so it'll be way too long. But anyway, that's just me. Um, so I think one of the most important things that I can say about getting the top surgery is number one, you have to have a really supportive partner or a family member or friend who can take an entire week off of work to be with you for the first week. Um, fortunately, my partner took some vacation days at work and was able to do that for me. And, um, and also he can work from home. So when he went back to work, he could work from home and take care of me. You really have to have that. The first week, absolutely, you will not survive without that support you can't do anything. And I want to go over some of the things that you can't do because I think that uh, uh, people underestimate the things that you can't do. For one, you have to understand, and you can test this, and I think everyone should. If you're thinking about getting a surgery and you don't have a really strong support team, or even if you do and you just want to be fully prepared and know how useless you're going to really be, what you need to do is take a belt and have someone strap your arms my aim is down there. Strap your arms right above the elbow to your waist so that you can't do anything but this with your arms. And that is the range of motion. Probably less than that because as you, as you can see I do this like it moves in here so even that hurts. You basically will be able to very carefully do this or very carefully do that or reach down and very carefully pick something in your lap up. For the first week, that's all you can do. So the things that you cannot do yourself are turn on and off light switches. Now, this may vary a little bit if you're much taller than me. I admit I am a short person. We're, we're Irish family and we were, we're built for mining. And um, so anyway, we, uh, we're all pretty short. Like my dad is also short. I am five foot two on a good day. I used to be 5'3", but I am 40 and I'm shrinking. That's no good, but it's the truth. Um, so things that I can't do, you might have better luck if you're like 5'8 or up, but I could not turn the light switches on the wall. Now you would think that being able to do this, I would be high enough to turn the light switch on, but it just required too much. Um, I don't have toggle switches. I have push button switches and they have like a tactile click and um, it takes a little bit of pressure to push them. And I didn't have the strength. You can't put your body behind it because you don't want to put any pressure on this. I mean, your arms aren't tied to you. Like, you don't want to squish them down. You're basically like this. You don't want to put your arms down. You don't want to put your arms up. You don't want to put your arms forward. You definitely don't want to do any twisting. You can't twist at all. Like, you can't do this. It will be really bad. So 
Everything you do, you have to turn your whole body from your hips, and you can basically only do it if you can reach it with your forearms. So light switches, the thermostat, so, um, and that's another thing. Um, definitely, if you're doing this, don't do it in the summer. And I'll get to that later, but there's a lot of reasons to do it over the winter. Winter is a great time to do it. But you won't be able to change the temperature of your house if you have a wall-installed thermostat at the traditional height because you can't raise your arm that high, unless you're tall. If you're a tall person, you know, you're like, you don't have my problems. Um, you won't be able to get anything out of the freezer. And in fact, if you're kind of short like me, and that means you also have short arms, um, you probably won't be able to get anything off of um, the top shelf in the refrigerator because you have to like kind of bend over and reach in to get it like this. So like really there's only like, you have to basically get down on your knees and get stuff off the bottom shelf. If you can get down on your knees in, in there, you can like get down and you can like reach in for things like this. So. Anything you need in the fridge, put on the bottom shelf. And um, the microwave, let me fix my camera, it does this because it's stupid. Sorry for the quality, it's just a really old camera and I'm cheap and I'm not going to replace it until it completely dies. Usually this works. Alright, there you go, I fixed it. Um, the microwave. You can't open it, and you can't reach into it. Um, definitely if it's one of those over-the-stove ones, but even mine on the counter. Like, I couldn't get my arms up enough to get things in and out of it. If you're tall, that might not be a problem. Um, the sink. You can't reach the faucets. Definitely not in the kitchen sink, and really not even in the bathroom sink, unless you've got, like, a really shallow one, or you can get around the side of it. Um, your toothbrush, you can't reach that. Um, the toothpaste. Like everything needs to be right on the edge of the sink for you to get to it. And you're probably going to have to have someone help you turn the water on and off if you've got a, a cranky type knob. If you've got one of the flippy ones, you probably can do it yourself. Um, the stove burners. Um, you can't cook. You can barely like open a package of crackers for the first two weeks. I can't like underestimate how weak you are. You're going to come out of, like, if you get the surgery, this is a really intensive surgery. These are, I haven't actually measured these scars. I probably should because that would be interesting. But um, these are probably nine inch long scars. So, and then all the way around here, that's also probably two inches of scar. So, I mean, I've got, you know, over two feet, well, probably about two feet of scars, you know, that just open wounds. So, you're exhausted. You're just literally exhausted. And actually, that's a good thing because you're also in a lot of pain. Now, I have a, um, I have a severe disabling anxiety condition, and I also have fibromyalgia. So I have a really, really good, strong medical team. And um, my doctor, um, and also I can't take Tylenol, so um, my doctor was really good and prescribed me real pain pills to get me through the first two weeks. And also my psychiatrist prescribed me real um, benzos for my anxiety. If you don't have real pain pills and you don't have anything for the anxiety, it's going to suck even worse for you than it did for me. So don't underestimate that. Um, it's great that you're exhausted because you're going to be in a lot of pain, even on the pain pills. I was still in quite a bit of pain. I mean, I say it wasn't the worst thing in my life. Like, I've been through worse pain. There's definitely worse pain out there. Um, but it was pretty bad. And you're just so tired that you're too tired to be in pain, if that makes any sense. So you're in pain and you just can't anything like you just can't but luckily you're so exhausted that if you just sit down and do nothing you'll usually fall asleep maybe the pain pills and the benzos help me with that your results may vary definitely recommend trying to get them if you can but um if you have a history of addiction you're not going to get them because that's today's world um so the first week you have to have someone who will do everything for you you cannot i don't have a full cup but 
you take for granted that you're going to like be able to do things like hold your cup and drink but you really just can't like it you're so you're so tired like this cup feels like it weighs like 20 pounds when you pick it up and um so the little things are hard um eating um i watched another video of someone who had the, a similar surgery and they said that it was hard for them to even use a fork they had to use plastic utensils and i could see that um because it is it's really exhausting to even like just get food into your mouth because you you don't have your range of motion and you're you're exhausted uh so that comes back to i'm going to get there the uh the things that you can't do the the food issue is really big so you need really um someone to cook for you because nutrition when you're healing is really important so yeah you could get through it by like stocking some pop tarts and some bananas and, and you'd survive, but you really need to eat good. And you really can't do that because you can't cook at all. And it's not just for the first week. I wasn't able to, um, to like cook something on the stove for, I think it was a full month because just the weight of the frying pan, you can't carry it. You can't pick it up to put it on. You can't like shake it. You know how you shake things when you're cooking, you flip things over with the spatula. You can't do any of that. So you can't cook. And then the microwave is hard because uh, most things that you put in the microwave are going to be in a dish and the dish is heavy. And then you have to deal with the door and the pushing the buttons and it's just, it's really hard. So you really have to have someone who's going to cook for you. Um, other things you can't do. For me, example, I have um, a tower desktop PC that's on my desk. It's right here making noise. You can probably hear it in the background. Um, it has a power button on the top. And actually, you can see me reaching over towards it right now. My hand is right next to the power button. You can see that you totally would not be able to do that. Um, even standing up. Now, I'm in a cage. I have a loft bed that I'm under, so I can't stand up. But even if I could stand all the way up, I wouldn't have been able to raise my arm to push that. Um, floor lamp switches. Um, you can't get up in there to get to them. Um, so basically what I did was, um, and I'll try to remember to edit this video and put a picture in of inserting things that I'm describing, but, um, I got drop lights, you know, like construction drop lights, little clamp on drop lights. And I clamped one onto the towel bar in my bathroom because I couldn't turn on the lights in the bathroom. Um, and I, um, and Luckily, I mean, I, I have a pull chain light over the sink in my kitchen, so I put a really long, like, ceiling fan bead chain on that so that I could reach it to turn that light on and off. And then, um, it was really hard, the things that you can't do. Um, anything that requires you to raise or stretch your arms. I have cats, and so it was a month before I could change the kitty litter. Um, I didn't want to ask my partner to do that because he's not a cat person. So um, I scooped it really, really thoroughly and like did my best, but it was pretty nasty by the time I could change it. Um, <laughs> so if you have pets, like if you have a dog that you have to take out for walks, you're not going to be able to do that for a long time because a dog pulling on a leash is just not going to work. Um, I feed my cats up on top of a dresser and even just getting my arms up high enough to like put the cat food in the bowl because you take it for granted. You pick up the bag of cat food and you pour it into the bowl. You know, it's like you just, you do that. You don't think about it. You can't just do that. There's nothing that you can just do. So basically you can't do anything for, you know, the first week you can barely even like stay awake other than the pain wakes you up. Um, one thing that's really important that um, is, is kind of an unmentionable is like wiping yourself. Um, for me personally, um, uh, this may not be the same for everyone who doesn't have the long scars, but like in order to wipe, you have to like reach forward like this to go between your legs. There's my camera doing that again. Um, so you can't really like do this motion and you can't twist around like this to go from the back because that stretch is like super, super painful. Yeah, fix the light in here. It's really bad. Um, so uh, 
it's hard to even do things like wipe your own ass. So there's a few things that I really think that everyone needs to stockpile before they get their surgery. So like the two weeks leading up to your surgery, there's a large shopping list of things you're going to want. And then um, you might as well go ahead and get the things that you're going to want for like the next month because going out and getting to the drugstore to get more bandages is exhausting. You can't get in and out of the car by yourself. And you don't think about how much you use your arms and your upper body when you're getting in and out of a car. Like, it's not even a sports car. It's like Subaru Outback. It's not like it's hard to get in and out of. And you just, you can't. You have to have someone open your door. You have to like waddle your way into the seat. You have to have someone close the door. You go to the store. You try to get your stuff off of the shelf if you can't reach for it. Um, you go to the cash register. You need to swipe your debit card. Even that's hard. Like, everything is so hard. So stock up on things. So I'm going to tell you the things that I found really helpful for me and your doctor may suggest something different. So if they do, you might want to follow their advice instead of mine, but I think my shit turned out pretty good. Um, so I had some pulled stitches, so there's a couple of wide spots, but I think it's pretty good all in all. Um, things you're going to need to get before you go. So, um, one of the things that my doctors and the nurse, well, the nurse specifically, the nurses thought this was freaking brilliant. They couldn't believe no one had ever thought of it before. So um, you're going to come home from surgery and you're going to have, if you're a normal person, which I'm not, you're probably going to have a bunch of tape. And if you're not a normal person and you're allergic to adhesives like me, you're going to have a lot of um, just gauze stuck to you. They're going to take this nasty roll of gauze and they're going to just wrap it over everything. This gauze is the worst thing ever. Um, for one, you've got these big wide incisions with these big open stitches and they're putting this open weave gauze over it. So when you get home and you take off your, um, your compression vest for the first time, they give you a, most of the times, they give you a vest and it closes in the front. Um, it's, it's just like a binder, except instead of having to pull it on over and off your head or over your hips, it, it closes in the front. You're going to take that off and you're going to have a lot of padding. And as you peel off the layers of the onion to reveal your new self, you're going to see um, things stuck in things. And the things that are stuck in the things are the scariest things you've ever seen in your life. Um, so you have these giant Frankenstein looking stitches or maybe staples. I had both. Um, you, you'll have stuff stuck in them. The gauze, it's open weave and it gets stuck. So I don't have it anymore because I used it all, but there's, um, there's this great wound care solution. It's made by Johnson's. It comes in a blue bottle. It's called Johnson's wound wash. And I highly recommend getting at least one bottle of that because one, it doesn't sting at all, period. It won't sting. I've used it for a million things. I've used it for some really gnarly, gnarly cuts, and it does not sting. So you can um, put something underneath your incisions like this, and then just, it comes in a squirt bottle. You can just squirt it over all the stuff that's sticking, and then just wait, and then squirt a little more, and then wait. And then you can carefully start like peeling the stuff out of your scabs and incisions. And um, if you don't do that, it's going to be really scary. I mean, it was really scary anyway, but, um, once you get that done, you'll have like these big gaping lines of stitches and your doctor will tell you to put an ointment on them. And the ointment that my doctor told me to use was Aquaphor healing ointment. It comes in these little tubes. It's like a, a petroleum jelly, except it has more, um, moisturizers in it. The key, he said, was keeping things moist. If you keep things moist, then you don't get as many scabs and you don't get tearing, you don't get pulling. Um, this stuff also comes in a tub like this. And I don't know if you can see, this is a tub I've had for a year, but like it's got nasty cat hair and shit in it. And you don't want to be putting that on your incisions. So definitely get the tubes because the tubes remain sterile. You can clean your hands before you get it, squirt a little out on your finger and close it and it stays clean. Um, you'll want to put your ointment very thickly over all of your incisions. You just want to 
glop the stuff on. You'll go through a ton of this, which is basically why I bought a whole case of it. This camera, I really need to replace it. Actually, what I really need to do is like learn how to live with daylight. It just doesn't like the low light conditions. Oh, fine. I'll live with the daylight. Oh, it's blinding me. All right, so anyway, now I'm being blinded. Aquaphor ointment. You can't even see it because it's like so bright. Um, that. And you'll need um, non-stick pads. Um, don't get regular gauze. Like you can get like gauze pads. It'll say like gauze or something like that. Make sure you get the ones that say non-stick pads. These are Rexall brand. That's really just too blown out to even see anything. We're gonna have to deal with it going out of focus. So these are Rexall brand non-stick pads. And these are really good. These are the, um, there's 10 sterile pads. They're three by four inch each. So if you have a double incision, what you're going to do, and I hate to open this, but I want to show you guys. Um, these pads, they're, they've got like a plastic coating on them. They're not just open gauze. This stuff, um, it's, it's perforated, so liquid will pass through and it will soak it up, but it won't stick. So every time you, you redo your chest after you shower, or you won't be able to shower for the first week, but if you just want to touch up with them, um, I'll get to that. Um, you're going to want to put like, it's going to take a lot of these. It takes a lot. Like you can see here, I'm starting at the edge of this scar and that only covers like not even half of it. So you're going to use like three of these on each side and then you can take one and cut it in half and, and put it like over each nipple. And you're going to need a tape that you're not allergic to. Now, if you're like me and you're allergic to basically every adhesive on earth, this is a godsend, but it's really expensive. This is um, Sika tape. It's like $16 a roll, but it's the only thing I can use that doesn't... Um, peel my skin off with it and leave me a nasty rash. It's this really nice, it's a silicone tape. Um, and it, it holds stuff pretty good. It's really flexible and soft. And some people use this over their scars because um, the recommended treatment for reducing scars is silicone over it. So I guess I can get to that. The things that you want to have for putting over your scars after they after they're no longer open wounds so you're going to do this with the um the aquifer and the non-stick gauze what is for as long as you've still got like the stitches are there and you've got like open wounds after they all close and you know the stitches absorb you'll have absorbable sutures and staples i had both um you can switch over to a different routine um let's not quite go off of that this aquaphor ointment is disgustingly gooky. It's very gooky, but it's very essential. So what I was saying that um, the nurse just thought was really brilliant is um, undershirts. These are 100% cotton men's undershirts. Actually, this is a boy's extra large because I'm not that big of a person. And what you're going to want to do is um, turn them all, get them, wash them in a detergent with no scent, like one of those free and clear ones, and um, turn them inside out. So the seams are facing out. That's very important. And uh, here's the key. Here's what I did that they thought was great. Here's like a, this is a boy's extra large. And you can see that's like the perfect size for me, and probably for a lot of trans guys. Um, there we go. This is a men's small. Um, men's small is also not too bad. Um, I prefer the v-necks of the men's smalls where the boys have, um, crew necks. So, you can do whichever works for you. One thing that I'm going to recommend is just get like the cheap, like the six packs. You can get them on Amazon. I got half from Amazon and half from Walmart because I needed more. 
I got the mints from Amazon really cheap. They're just like Fruit of Loom or Hanes or something like that. Uh, I also got like a three pack of these really nice undershirts for like the first week. These are great. I don't know how to pronounce that brand. Lacoste it has an alligator on it. This is the, um, the slim fit men's small and the material is just so luscious and delicious and feels great against your skin. But the thing is, the next step, what you have to do, you can't actually raise your arms to get shirts on and off. So at least three of these undershirts you got to have someone else do your laundry too. You can't do any laundry. At least three of these undershirts, what you're going to want to do is um, take a pair of scissors and cut them straight down the middle so they're a vest. I have an old one here that's all stained that I cut up to show you. Because what you're, you can't use, lift your arms. So what you're going to do is you're going to have this vest-like shirt and you're going to like put it like this. And you're going to have someone help you get it around the back. You can't do this when you're... You're going to have them, like, carefully put your arm in it, and you're going to, like, you're going to, like, go like this as gentle as you can and try to, like, get this thing on. And what you do is, um, take it and cross this piece over here and cross this piece over here and close it with a piece of tape. And then put your compression vest over this because you get one compression vest. One. They send you home with one. And if you get it all nasty with your ointment, it's disgusting and you can't do anything about it. You have to wear it 24 hours a day, seven days a week for the next two months, which is another reason why I said do this in the winter because these shirts get nasty. You can't even shower for the first couple of weeks. Um, they don't tell you this at the hospital. They don't tell you this. They don't, they, they say, you know, like you can stop putting the bandages on. So once you stop putting the gauze on it, they're going to tell you, they're going to tell you to stop putting the gauze on it. They want it to breathe. So once you stop putting the gauze on it, it's going to be nasty. It's going to be really, really nasty. So they expect, I guess, that you're just going to, um, to put your, only binder straight in all that nasty goop every single day and you can't wash it you can't dry it in the dryer so like you can hand wash it but it takes overnight to dry and you can't go without it for that long because you're supposed to wear it 24 hours a day except for the 15 minutes that you take it off to shower or to clean up so uh undershirts man buy them buy a ton of them cut at least three of them however many you need like if you don't have someone who's going to do your laundry all week you have to cut up seven of these things um so that's why i say get the cheap ones because like these really nice super great lacoste ones that i love i cut up two of them and then i threw them away after like a month and it's just tragic because these are really nice undershirts and um and you're going to be wearing men's undershirts so get those, do that, make them into vests, put them on, put your ointment on and then put that on like a vest and then put your, your surgery binder on over that. It'll save you a lot of hassle. Um, so more things that you need to do. Baby wipes, just buy a case of the damn things. You're going to go through so many. One, you can't wipe your ass. Two, you can't bathe. Um, and here's the thing, these baby wipes are not, they're not made for like adult stank. You're going to have to get the baby wipes and some alcohol. And you're going to have to put the alcohol on the baby wipe. And you're going to, basically you have to have your, your partner, your friend, your family member, whoever's taking care of you, has to basically sponge bathe you with the baby wipes because you won't be able to, um, to do it. You can't like get to this underarm with this arm because you see how you have to reach across here to get to here you can't you can't do that so basically you're going to like raise your arms this much and it's going to be absolutely terrifying while your partner like tries to scrub under your arm as gently as possible and then putting on deodorant in that position is like it's super hard like you just have to kind of like wedge it in there as best you can and you're doing that for a long time um other things that I highly, highly, highly recommend, and some things that I think are completely useless. I'll save you some money. Um, 
after you get past the whole like putting the ointment on and your scabs are healed, you're going to want to moisturize a lot. That's the best thing you can do for your scar formation is stay moisturized and use silicone tape or strips. So I'm going to go over the moisturization first and then I'll get to the strips. What I did was um, I have really dry skin. So I got a, um, a bath oil. This is, um, now I don't, this one kind of sucks because you see the bottom is white. It has coconut oil in it. And that sounds great and it smells great. But the thing is, coconut oil, um, if you live in the tropics or, you know, like Georgia, you're probably not going to get this. But I live in Vermont. Coconut oil is a solid in Vermont, especially in the winter. So basically, it's got chunks in it. So um, unless you live somewhere where it's um, 80 degrees plus, don't get one with coconut oil in it. Um, but do get a good bath oil. Um and along those lines, um, you're going to need something to, to shower with um, once you can. After your drains come out, you can start showering very carefully. You can't actually um, raise your arms. So you have, to, um, you have to get a handheld sprayer. And the smallest one you get is better because you're going to have to be trying to like wedge this large shower head and make it spray up under your arms to clean there because you can't raise your arm. Normally when you're showering, you know, you just raise your arm and scrub. Oh, I'm really red. Um, you just raise your arm and scrub. You can't do that for a long, long time. For like at least two months, you can't, you don't have full range of motion. Like I just now got, it's, it's four months in and when I do this, I still feel some tightness across here and, um, <clears throat> and I can't, I just now got to where I could do like my shoulder presses again. Like I got my authorization to start working out again and like doing my shoulder presses was really scary. Um, on like the three month mark, I still had some soreness around the nipple. But showering, you're going to um, want a soap that um, one, works really good. Two, can be used for everything, including your hair. And three, rinse is really easy because one, Showering when you're that exhausted is just, it's really hard. Um, you're going to want to get in. You're going to want to get as clean as possible, as quickly as possible. And you're going to want to get out because if you stay in there too long, you're not going to be able to step out of the bathtub because it will just be so exhausting. So I found this grape soap <clears throat> that I highly recommend. One of the, another thing that's really, um, and it, might be backwards because I mirror my camera so all the labels are probably backwards but I have dyslexia so if the thing that's behind my left shoulder isn't in the same direction in my video I get really confused um but this is dove shower foam this is the for sensitive skin one and this stuff works so good um you're going to want to put have someone if you live by yourself just before you um, before you go into the hospital, install like a handheld shower attachment to your shower and just lay it in the bottom of the bathtub. You know how they normally hook like up on the shower head thing? Um, you can't reach that. So you're going to have to rig that up so that it um, it's on the floor so that you can get to it. So the soap is great. You can, you'll, you'll have to kneel you'll you'll step in to the bathtub <clears throat> and you're gonna have to like to get to turn the knobs on you'll you'll turn your shower on and get the water adjusted as best you can you know doing this um or this as the case may be and you'll you'll kneel down in the bathtub because the only here's the way you have to wash your hair it's the only way you can wash it you can't raise your arms okay you don't think about this stuff every day but you really use your arms a lot when you're showering so the only way that you can wash your hair is um i'll try to do it on my chair so you can see because it's really ridiculous you have to get um you have to get on your knees in the bottom of the shower and you put your head down between your legs and then you can do this if that's how you have to shower your hair. But like a month, this is the best you can do. So, uh, <laughs> it's ridiculous. But that's what you have to do. So, get a really easy rinsing body wash. This one is really great. The Dove shower foam. And then, um, 
after after you can raise your arm, that's still like I'm just gonna use this forever because it's the best body wash I've ever found. I love it. And um, once you can get back to where you can raise your arms, like I can now, after about month two, you'll be able to to do like your normal shower routine and like start using your shampoo again and things like that. But for the first month, you definitely can't. So get a one soap that does everything and make sure it rinses off really easy. Um, while you're still wet from your shower, once you're healed and you know you're showering normally again, uh, put a body oil over everything. Like just put a nice coating of oil and then do a quick rinse under the hot water so you have like just oil. And then when you get out of the shower, just really carefully like pat things with a towel. Be really careful because you're going to want to dry your underarms like this, but you have to really just pat. And then I found a couple of different things for moisturizers that I think are great. And a couple of things that I bought with a lot of hope that didn't work out at all. And I'll tell you why. Um, the best moisturizer that I found um, is this is a Quate Beauty moisturizing. It's just women's face moisturizer. It's it's meant to be like a ripoff of Olay. It actually says like compare to Olay active hydrating beauty fluid lotion. So you can get the Olay active hydrating beauty fluid lotion if you want, or you can get the Equate one that costs like $2 less. This stuff is great. So just use this over everything that was cut and it'll soak in really quick and it, it I was using some other lotion. Like, I, I really love this lotion. I've gone through a lot of lotions through this. I really like this lotion. But um, it leaves kind of like, if you put on a lot of it, it gets kind of like, it peels off. It gets weird. So, the the Olay ripoff one soaks in all the way, and that's really good. And another thing that I, my doctor, now, some doctors no longer recommend scar massage. My doctor was very adamant that it was necessary. So I did it a little bit. Um, I don't really think I needed it because my scars feel pretty flat. I put that ointment on this one now. It feels all gross. Um, but uh, I did it a little bit. So I got a couple of things. You're going to need an oil to do your scar massage because your fingers really need to glide. And also I found this little thing that's great. So I have this. Um, I love this company. It's called Plant Therapy. Pure Essential Oils. They have this one called skin restore synergy and it, I mean like it just smells good it doesn't do anything it's all just it's hokum but it comes with this really this rollerball applicator which is really nice because this small size it's about the size of your finger and you can do the outside of your um of your neck I have a little hard area right there that I've been concentrating on and so you can roller use the rollerball on this and it just, I think it's just more effective than using your fingers and um, this this thing pops out. You can pull the rollerball out. Just refill it with bio oil or the generic ripoff of bio oil. I really love bio oil. It's great stuff. It doesn't make you break out. Like I use it on my face. I have, I'm have i pretty acne prone and it doesn't make me break out. Um, I also got this little mini massage ball roller for doing the bigger areas um, after you oil it so things don't pull. You can see I've kind of gotten used to the process. You can use the, one of these roller balls to roll over the... It doesn't like my low light. So you can use the roller ball to roll over your scar. The, the doctor says to use your fingers and use like, you know, go like this over it with like moderate... Well, the surgeon didn't tell me shit. I had to go to my dermatologist to get like good advice. I didn't trust my surgeon. I have this really great dermatologist, um, Paraza Dermatology in Claremont, New Hampshire. They're fantastic. It's the it's a, a father and son thing, and um, the young Dr. Paraza, he's just a fantastic guy. And so I went into him to get advice from my dermatologist on the scarring because like the plastic surgeon is a surgeon. He knows how to like make things on the inside heal and maybe he can make the incisions look all right. But man, I've had so much surgery done by my dermatologist. I had like, 
a big piece of like precancerous skin thing pulled off my forehead and there's not even a trace of the scar. He's so good. So like I trust my dermatologist way more than my plastic surgeon as far as scar care goes. So I made an appointment with my dermatologist to talk about how to take care of the scarring. And I came away a lot more confident after that. He gave me a tube of this really expensive stuff that you can put on your scars for free. It's like $60 a tube. And uh, it feels great, but I don't think it does anything. He doesn't even think it does anything. He just sells it. Um, <laughs> but the rollerball is really good. I got that off of Amazon. It's called a mini rollerball. And uh, it saves your fingers some work. Some things that, uh, that I think you need. Now, one option... Um, you can look this up. Clinical studies have proven, blah, blah, that uh, the only thing that works for reducing scars is silicone. So you'll get things, um, the Mederma. You've heard the Mederma brand. Everyone's heard of Mederma. It's silicone ointment that you put on things, and it's supposed to help reduce the scarring. But most people say silicone tape or silicone strips. Now, this Sika tape that I got it has an adhesive that I'm not allergic to. It's a silicone adhesive which is the key, um, is $16 a roll. And if you see the size of my incisions, um, it's not reusable. So you put it on, you wear it for like a day, and then you peel your $16 tape off and you throw it in the trash. So, camera, come on. All right, so really feels bad doing that. So um, I still have like half the box just because I couldn't rationalize throwing away a $16 tape. I'll probably have it forever just because I don't want to use it because it's so damn valuable. But what I do recommend is um, these scar away strips. I've got it too bright in here for the scar away. I could probably unmirror the camera and you'd be able to read it, but you get the idea. Um, this is the box that, um, these are the long silicone scar sheets. This is a six month supply, so there's 12 sheets in here. Now, I've gotten masterful at making these last a lot longer than they're designed to, and I'll show you what I did. These, um, these come in these little paper packages, and they're reusable. If you use regular, um, Dawn dish soap, not a moisturizing one, you can use the antibacterial one I did, it works fine, but not the moisturizing one. You um, you wash them and you stick them on a piece of plastic. Um, this box doesn't come with this piece of plastic, which I actually complained to the company about. If you get the um, scar away for C-sections in the pink box, it's the exact same product as this. There's just less to a box. It comes with this really nice plastic strip, which I'll show you why that's important. So you're going to wash these under hot water with some dish soap. This is a piece of plastic that I pulled from the inside of like a binder from Walmart from the school supply section. And these are my strips. I'm not wearing any right now. They're all clean and ready to go. So these strips, according to the manufacturer, last up to two weeks. I've been using these strips for like almost a month and they still stick. The key is to wash them with the dish soap. This one's actually coming unshriveled. It's so old. Actually, maybe that's a cat feather. <laughs> but um, wash them and stick them to something clean. You can also stick them to like your bathroom mirror, which I did before I found this piece of plastic because the piece of plastic that came with it clearly only holds, you know, one strip on each side. And I'm using, you have to put them on basically all the time. So you want to have two sets in rotation, one that's being washed and dried, you know, and then the other one that you're wearing while that one dries overnight. So there's just not enough room to store them. You can stick them to your mirror, but it leaves like some gook on your mirror and you have to use like some rubbing alcohol to get the gook off. And it's just, and you can't see through your mirror. You have four giant strips hanging on it all the time. Um, you'll see this one that I cut. These are just pieces from a long one that I cut to cover my nipples. These are sized to cover my nipple areas. This one that has a circle in it is because um, I wanted my nipples to show, but I wanted to cover the incision because it was still sore. So I just cut a hole in the middle of one and made like a little ring. But if you wash those with dish soap and stick them on something and let them dry, they last a long time. And then here's the key to making them last a long time. Um, 
I know it's a dirty word and no one wants to talk about it, but after you have your top surgery, you're still going to have your binder laying around. So your old binder, I don't know where mine is right now, probably in the bathroom where I took it off last, is really, really handy for when you're recovering from your surgery because if you put your old binder on, it's not tight like it used to be because you don't have all the meat that was making it tight, but it's still snug. And most people will be, I had pretty large chest and mine's still snug. It's a lot more comfortable. Like it wasn't really comfortable before I had the surgery. Now it's comfortable. So put those on and then put your binder on over it. And they, they, because the, the binder holds them in place, the stickiness isn't as important. So like, even though these aren't as sticky as they were when they were new, they're still pretty sticky. And because I use something to hold them on, they last a long time. Now, there's two products that I got that I had a lot of hope for that just don't work at all. And one of them is the Mederma. The Mederma cream, this is the PM. I'm sure the regular one is the same. I don't think it does anything. Um, it doesn't moisturize and it doesn't leave a coating of silicone. The, the the theory behind the silicone ointments is they take the replace they replace the silicone strips or the silicone tape. You can just put it on and forget about it. But the thing is, I don't think it actually leaves a barrier of silicone. I don't know if my skin just absorbs all the silicone, but it, like 10 minutes after I put this on, it feels all dry and pulley and it, it's just no good. And another thing about that is um, the, this, the strips or the tape, whichever way you want to go, you can tape with silicone tape or you can get the strips like I did, or you can do both. It, the strips particularly, they're kind of thick. So they add a layer of padding, which is really nice. Um, they're kind of cushy. So this, these things are pretty sore for a while. And especially if you're someone like me who doesn't sleep good, I toss and turn all night and I sleep on my side. So I had a lot of pressure on these. And so just having the strip there is nice because one, if you like raise your arm and put it under your pillow stupidly at night, which I sometimes did, you, um, you pull this and having the, the silicone strip holding things together makes it so that it doesn't actually pull. So I highly recommend those. Whether they do anything to make the scarring less or not, I don't know. I still recommend them because you're just more comfortable. You'll be able to get back in your normal clothes um, without your binder on much faster for like going out on the town or whatever because they'll have cushioning and you'll be able to like put the seat belt across and you'll have that little bit of padding and things like that. Um, another thing that I got that I had really high hopes for because I love this Sika tape um, I got the Sika solution. Um, this is a silicone scar bar. It basically looks like a deodorant stick, but it is, um, it's basically a stick of solidified silicone. And, and while it does leave like a coating, if you like do this, it's really hard. And like it pulls, like you can see how that's yanking my skin. See how that's pulling and dragging. And when you have like mine are healed enough now that this doesn't, if I pulled this way, this would still hurt, but, um, it hurts, it hurts to put it on. So it might be a really good product, but, um, unless you're fairly well healed and you can like pull on your scars, like, like this, like, see, I'm having to pull the skin tight and then smear this on it. It's going to hurt. So great product. Um, if you can tolerate the pain of putting it on, I guess, but, um, but by far and away, the scar away definitely worked better for me. Um, what else can I touch on? You're going to, um, all right. So back on the sleeping situation, I'm a tosser and turner and, um, I'm normally a side sleeper when I finally fall asleep because I have back issues. And so the only way that I can sleep is on my side with my knees curled up to release the pressure on my lower back. And because you can't sleep on your side after the surgery, um, I had to rig myself up. First, I was at my partner's for the first week, and um, he has a really nice lazy boy recliner. So I, I, I covered that because I didn't want to ruin it, um, you know, with blood and ointment and stuff. I covered that with... Um, with a waterproof mattress pad 
and then I put a, a, a big like king size fitted sheet over that and like tied it in a knot behind it and then I had like um, six fluffy pillows and um, I would take the pillows and I would stuff them down on because I'm kind of small so the lazy boy has lots of extra space so I stuffed pillows down beside my hips and then he carefully would put like a pillow here and a pillow here over the arms so my arms were kind of like in this position you're gonna have if if your doctor does drains most of them that do double incision do the drains um, you'll have your drains and basically the best place to clip them is on the front of your um, surgery binder but right at your waist right together in the front because they're big and they hang down so you want to not get them snagged in anything and if you're in a recliner it's really good because you can't really move so if you've got your arms on the pillows and you're tucked in by pillows the only thing that you really need to sleep then is a neck pillow the donut the donut's absolutely essential do not do the surgery without getting a donut um, unfortunately um, the the actual sprinkled donut was the only one Walmart had when I went but you want one that has the snap in the front like this because um, you might be comfortable with it like this when you lean back but there's quite a bit of head space here um, so what I found after a while was I was actually more comfortable if I turned it around this way where I could just kind of rest my chin on this part but if you do it that way it will just fall off so make sure whatever type of closure it has on this little flap make sure it's nice and secure this one has a really good snap this was just one from Walmart, I think. And um, this is like a really, really essential piece of equipment that you're going to need to sleep. So don't neglect that. And I think that's really everything that is essential. Support, someone to help you because you can't do anything. Um, if you can't have someone there with you, you're going to need to put everything that you need on the floor because you can't get to anything that's on a shelf or on the wall so I mean I don't even recommend like doing the surgery if you don't have someone who can be with you there be there with you for at least the first week but if you if you really can't do that and you really have to do it alone um, get like several cases of bottled water and put it on the floor um, and and cut the plastic off before you go to the hospital because you can't you can't do anything you have no strength in your arms put your microwave on the floor get one of those little dorm fridges you know the little tiny ones like you put in your college dorm put it on the floor put you know whatever you need to keep cold in there put your microwave on the floor put your toilet paper on the floor put your mouthwash on the floor put your sh your handheld shower in the bottom of the bathtub like e everything you need just assume that you're not going to be able to reach it and put it on the floor before you go into your surgery because you really can't reach anything um, and if it's on the floor you can at least get down on your knees and get to it somehow um, you might want to invest in some drinking straws um, I personally hate drinking from straws I think it's stupid and, I mean, there's a lot of ecological reasons not to use straws um, but I've never really liked them anyway even long before we realized global warming was a thing and um, but like holding your cup up is really hard so you might want to just like have someone bring you your drink and then like bend over and drink out of a straw so you might want to get some straws and um, yeah just assume just assume that you won't be able to do anything and also assume that you're going to not be completely 100% happy with your with your results um, this looks pretty good, but I'm not 100% happy with it. It has like these these rolls here that I I don't like that at all. Um, and we might can actually resolve that with just some liposuction. I'll talk to my doctor about it. But the chances of you being 100% satisfied with your result is pretty low. I don't think that out of all the groups that I've been on getting support from this since I went through with it that I've heard many people who have been 100% happy with the very first outcome without revision. Revision is almost always necessary. So be happy, be hopeful, but be realistic. Um, you're probably going to be a lot happier than you were, 
But um, there are always risk involved with any major surgery, and your doctor will tell you this, and I don't want you to, like, lose sleep over it, but you can, of course, die under anesthesia. You could get a really bad doctor. You don't know. I mean, you don't know. My doctor didn't have any before and after photos. I had to go completely on faith. He was the only doctor that my insurance had that would be covered. I had no choice who to go to and someone to pay for it out of pocket, which I can't afford. And so you might end up with a really bad surgeon. Um, I've heard some pretty bad horror stories about people who woke up with completely the wrong surgery done. Um, they wanted to keep their nipples and they were gone or they had like these scars that were straight across like a, a breast cancer type mastectomy instead of the ginger reaffirming surgery. So just be prepared. Like, don't base your whole life on the outcome of your surgery. Be, um, be conservative with your hope. Uh, hope for the best and, and, and expect the best. Demand the best. But if you don't get the best, always know that you can always go in and have it corrected later. Um, you may have to save for 10 years. Like, I'm probably going to have to. Um, but it's always fixable. Everything's fixable. Um, if your nipples, if one of your nipples fails, um, they'll, they'll, they'll fix it and you can go and you can get a tattoo. Um, you can see that mine aren't completely round. I'm going to go get some tattoo work to make them look round again. Um, I'm probably going to get tattoos eventually that will cover all of my scars. And, and that's a good solution. Like if you have something that doesn't turn out right, just cover it with a tattoo. But be realistic, stay realistic, and um, be prepared for the pain, the anxiety. Oh, that's one other thing I should mention. Um, I have severe claustrophobia. Um, severe claustrophobia. Um, sometimes getting in elevators is really hard for me. I can't, um, sometimes just wearing a shirt is hard for me. Like sometimes I'll feel like I just can't breathe and I'll have to like take off my shirt and go outside. Like even being in a room triggers it. So it's really severe claustrophobia. And that was one of the things that I talked to my psychiatrist really, really a lot before I went in with the surgery, because after you get the surgery, you have to wear your post-surgical binder. There's no option. You cannot take it off. So for me, that was a really, really hard thing to deal with because if I had an anxiety attack while I had that on, I would not be able to get out of it. And that was like a major trap. And um, I, I didn't, I mean, I've always been a little claustrophobic, but this got really bad when I was homeless because I was living in a tent. And I think that just, it triggers a lot of bad things. So if you have claustrophobia or any sort of thing like I do with um, with tight things or being trapped, it's going to be really hard to be stuck in that binder for the next two months of your life. And that's about how long it is. Um, I, I had my, um, my appointment where my doctor told me that it was okay to... Um, to take my binder off. I'm looking it up now on the phone. It wasn't that long ago. It was sometime in April that I finally got permission. So I had my surgery in um, well, February. I had my surgery in December on the 21st and I got authorization from my doctor to not wear the binder 24 seven. Um, only on February 19th. That's a long time to be trapped in a binder, not being able to take it off for more than like 20 minutes. So, but you want to do what your doctor says. So just understand that and like be prepared and, um, and you'll be all right. You'll be okay. Just as long as you're prepared and you know what to expect. And, um, if you like me have an anxiety condition that's triggered by that, get some appropriate medication before you go in like I did. If you have that condition, you're going to have, hopefully you have a psychiatrist who will be willing to help you out.
but um yeah it's all good like I'm really I'm really happy um I think it's I think it's great I, I've been going um outside shirtless it just it just warmed up enough in Vermont so um so I can go outside and I've been going outside like this is what I wore all day today I went out and took the cat litter out and things like that and um it's really I don't want to be hokey and say empowering, but it's like it's like a sense of freedom that I never had before. Like I finally feel like I'm not trapped in this stupid female body that had so many limitations. Like there's so many things that you can't do with a female body that I wanted to have the freedom to do. Like I know they say like I don't want to get on like a sexist rant, but women's rights are one thing. But they're kind of a lie too, because in most places in the country, a woman can't go without a shirt in public, and a man can. And um, I wanted that really badly. I wanted it so badly that I had my body changed to get it. So, um, I mean, yeah, I kind I wanted a male body anyway. But I'm not gonna lie. Like, um, a lot of my motivation was just to to not be female anymore, and to not be female to me meant a lot of freedoms that women just don't have. Like the one that I have right now, like being able to post this video on YouTube and not getting it removed because I have a male chest now. Um, and being able to take my cat litter out, going to the beach like this, just things that you can't do. And it's great. It's just, it's great. It's really good. I love it. And um, I recommend anyone who, who wants to be free to do this because to me it felt like the only way the only way to be free in this country is to be a man and um, now I am so it's great I love it I'm going to be legally changing my name to a male name and um, as you can tell from my voice I haven't done testosterone. I'm seriously considering doing that. I don't really want body hair, so that's kind of like the only thing holding me back there. I don't need more maintenance. I have enough in my life to take care of without having to like shave off more body hair. <sighs> but it's really tempting. And uh, takes a lot. Of, it takes a lot of thought. You know, like, you can't, you, this isn't just something you decide to do overnight. I've always been, um, I guess a tomboy. And, um, I've always done boy things. Um, I had a BMX bike that I used to ride around the woods on the trails. And, um, instead of having doll houses when I was younger, I had, um, cliffhangers, race car set, and even before that, I had a, a spring horse, and I remember riding it across the room. Like, looking back at my childhood and the things that I did and the way that I was, I definitely was a little boy. And um, and I think the, the thing that took me so long to discover that I wasn't the girl that I had grown up as is just where I was. My location and my level of education. So I was in Tennessee, and Tennessee is very backwards. And um, and it never, it was never something that I knew that you could be anything other than what you were born as. And um, as a little girl growing up down south in the um, the eighties and the nineties, basically, um, your parents will tell you that you could be anything you want to be when you grow up. But um, what they don't tell you is you really, you're, you'll always, what well, my dad says it the best, he says, you'll always be my little girl. And um, oh, it's really annoying. And I know a lot of, a lot of trans people get that. But um, you don't have to be. You can change it. And um, the fact that you can is amazing and empowering. And I'm really grateful that um, that I moved to Vermont, where there are progressive people and progressive ways of thinking, 
and I met first I met you know <laughs> people of different color and I met people of different religions and I met people of different orientations and then I met trans people and gay people and I met all these people that I was just not connected to at all in Tennessee in Tennessee and after my parents divorced Arkansas the middle of nowhere Arkansas it was all like my future down there was basically being a housewife it was really the only future that I had I didn't I, I didn't have a college education um, and I didn't have any future so when I moved to Vermont, I did a few things. I learned a lot. I, I, I am now, I'm finishing up college and, um, and I learned that there are things out there that I didn't know existed before. I learned how to not be a racist and for the most part, not to be a sexist, although that's hard because, you know, I hate my, I hated myself as a woman and I, I'm sure that comes across in hating other women, um, which is unfair. But I'm just being honest. Um, I don't. I never liked myself, and I probably don't like other women either because I just everything that I see about them reminds me of what I was, and what I was stuck as. And probably now that I'm not, I'll probably be less of a sexist, and um, and that will be good too. But just coming up here and meeting people who had gone through transition and seeing that it was something that could be done. Like, I didn't know it was possible. I didn't know it existed. No one had ever told me that boys turned into girls, girls turned into boys, and there were people that weren't either. And so, yeah, I was like, in my mid-30s, before I even knew that this existed, and now I'm 43, and I just had it done. Um, and it's not because... I waited too long or I wasn't sure or I didn't know who I was. I mean, I just didn't know that you could do anything about it. I was like powerless. And so when I came up here and I learned these things, I'm like, woo, you can fix this. It's like, yeah, why would I not do that? So I did. I am. I fixed it. And now I'm me. And that feels really amazing. It's great. Just do it. You won't regret it.